Okay, today on the show, we have Ryan McCain from Redfin. Now, Ryan got his start in the real estate industry in 2003 as both a realtor and a mortgage broker working for his stepmother's real estate brokerage here in Chicago. Uh, since then, he's worked as a leasing agent with Chicago Apartment Finders. He also spent a few years in property management and commercial real estate before getting back into residential real estate about five years ago, where he is now a top 1% producer in in the Chicago land market. Uh, Ryan, welcome to the show. We're super excited to have you. Thanks, DJ. Like I said before, uh, long time listener, first time caller. <laughs> well, we, we love having our listeners uh, on the show. We love the fact that we have listeners. We're so, <laughs> so like uh, honored and grateful that anybody listens. Um, and the fact that uh, people find value from listening to people like yourselves, top producers is, is really uh, what we're all about. And, and we're so glad to connect uh, with, with some people that have been longtime uh, listeners. We, we've had that happen a bunch of times on the show where people say, Hey, um, you know, would you consider interviewing me? I'm a big fan. And, and uh, so, um, you know, that, I don't think that, I think we reached out to you specifically this time, but we do yeah. get that as well, which is a lot of fun, but I, we're, we're excited think, to have you. <laughs> I would think reaching out to a podcast to ask you to interview them, it's like inviting yourself to a party. It's like, <laughs> you know, uh, maybe it is, but I tell you, it makes the art makes our booking uh, go a lot easier. So we sure. love it when people say, because what we do is we, we were able to look up to see if they would be a good fit anyway, but we, we get uh, probably about 10, um, email requests a day. So we're constantly uh, having to evaluate, you know, would this be a good guest? And thankfully in the, in the, when we first started, we had to reach out to everybody and we had to reach out to 20 people, you know, and say, would you please be on the show? And thankfully now uh, people reach out to us, but um, well, I would love for our listeners uh, to learn more about you. And, and I know you've, you've been in and in, in about the real estate business, you know, really since the early two thousands, but can you tell us a little bit about how you got started? Talk about your trajectory. Cause you've had, you've worn a lot of different hats uh, before landing on, you know, traditional real estate broker. So um Let's let's start at the beginning. Sure. Uh, depending on if you want the the long version or the short version of my uh, biography. Um, so as you mentioned, I started working for my uh, my stepmom's uh, real estate company out in uh, Orland Park back in uh, 2003, which uh, I actually got started with uh, Ray Morandi. Who shout out to Ray? He was just named uh, on Chicago Agents uh, Chicago Agent Magazines. Uh, people you should know in 2020, uh, he's killing it out there still. He has his own brokerage. Um, so I actually got started working for my stepmom. And prior to that, uh, I was actually working at a steel plating factory in Joliet. Wow. Um, yeah. Yeah. It was, uh, and I'll never forget, um, I, <laughs> I came home from work one day and I had gotten covered almost head to toe. If I don't imagine anybody knows anything about steel plating because I would you, um, but I got covered head to toe in acid because you use acid to clean the steel and, and sure. And I got covered because one of the vats like splashed all over me. And literally I, I was sitting, uh, sitting at home, like getting ready to get in the shower. And I was like, what am I doing? I think at the time I was 22, 23, yeah. really have much going on. And uh, I decided that uh, I just needed a career. And my stepmom, my stepmom actually at the time, she had just a small brokerage. It was just her, her secretary, and maybe a few other brokers. But at one point, she had one of the largest Century 21 um uh, brokerages in the Southwest suburbs and wow. got sick of kind of all the headaches of managing that and be sure. babysitting brokers. So decided to get rid of it, downsize. And she was just kind of like a one woman show. And, uh, I will never forget. I was just like sitting at home, just getting ready to like get in the shower. And I, cause at the time I wasn't living at home anymore, but I, I called her up and said, Hey, can I, can we talk? <laughs> can I come work for you? And uh, she said, yeah, I need, I need help. Um, I need, you know, people to work for me. And um, so basically 
I was kind of like, you know, her junior agent slash secretary slash gopher. Um, and at that time, this was, yeah, 2003. At that time, you didn't need to be licensed to be a mortgage broker at that point, believe it or not. Interesting. Yeah, it was just like, you have a face, you have a name, you can originate mortgages. So I was actually not, I was actually in the first kind of like wave of people that actually had to get licensed. I'll never forget. You had to get uh, fingerprints, background check, sure. all that stuff. Um, but basically, um, so I got started working for my stepmom and she, <laughs> she was brutal. She was tough <laughs> Uh, she was definitely a big believer. Like if you are going to do something, you need to know everything you like everything. If you're going to be a CEO of a company, you've got to learn how to sweep the floors. So that's yeah. her kind of mindset. Uh, so I had to, uh, when I was doing mortgages, I had to originate my own mortgages. I had to process them. I had to do every single step of the way. And then, um, but when it came to selling real estate, uh, I had to know everything. Uh, sure. Enter. We had a secretary, but she wouldn't. She wouldn't let. She wouldn't let the sec our secretary do any work for me. Like I had to enter all of my listings into the MLS. And back then, back then, uh, I mean, the MLS was online, but like barely. Barely, yeah. I remember, like the blue, like the blue screen, like when you would pull sure. the MLS. And and back then, now that I'm thinking about it. Back then, the MLS came in like discs, like it came yeah. like the, the the floppy disks. You had to install it on your computer, and then I think like the following year, they finally had like an online version. But mm -hmm. in order to uh, in order to enter your your listings in the MLS, it was like a blue screen, like a basic DOS screen. Yeah. You heard it, and um, but she just drilled absolutely drilled the fundamentals into me. Um, I mean, I remember even like faxing, I had to fax uh, uh, offers and contracts back and forth. And by the time you got done negotiating, the thing looked like a Rorschach test. It was just like <laughs> plots and just, you know, you couldn't even, it wasn't even legible, but um, she was tough. She was brutal, but I mean, still a lot of the things that she taught me, I still, used to this day sure um but what yeah you know, what I, oh God, yeah <laughs> yeah so so after leaving um from your stepmom's uh you know business where did you end where did you end up going after that so after that um i knew i wanted to be in the city and i didn't know the city you know very well i mean i i come down for cubs games and, and to hang out but i didn't know the market very well so i thought the best way to do that would be to do apartment leasing because it's high sure. It's quick turnover. Um, Great so, way to learn the neighborhoods. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. You're going to do a lot more. Uh, you're going to do a lot more business and you're going to do a lot more transactions. And there's just more, a lot more. Um, there's a lot more activity so you can learn the, the city and the neighborhoods a lot better, uh, a lot faster, I should say. So I worked for Chicago Apartment Finders for about two. After that. Um, I was actually out visiting my dad and stepmom who had since moved to uh, Orange County. Um, I was out there visiting them in September of 2008. And I'll never forget while I was out there visiting them on the news, they had not just announced like Lehman Brothers folded. Yeah. You know, what was going on in the world. And my brother and I had always wanted to move to California. And I just said to him, hey, look, he was actually... My brother was out there with me. He let, he came back to Chicago early. Um, and while I was out there, I texted him and said, hey, I really have no reason to come back to Chicago. Why don't we just move to California? And he basically brought all my stuff with him when he came out. And uh, when I was working out there, I was very fortunate that I got a job with a small real estate mortgage and staging company because obviously jobs in real estate were almost non-existent then but sure. very fortunate very lucky that i got a job with this company and um my boss uh ken schussler who's still a really good friend of mine to this day 
uh, was a great mentor, great person to learn from. But they were not only were they um, were they thriving in that market, but they were actually growing. Their company was getting bigger because they had a lot of uh, unique relationships with lenders in the area that had uh, that were offering decent programs for people. Uh, the ninja loans, the no income, no job, no asset loans were obviously gone at that point. Sure. But they were still able to, uh, they were still offering some unique programs that not everybody had. Um, and then I was also doing um, uh, foreclosures and REOs and all of that. And that was, again, that was early on when the banks just did not know how to handle that volume of foreclosures. So I'll never forget, again, having to fax the hardship package over to, excuse me, over to the banks and each page of the hardship package, which could be 80 to 100 pages, had to have the loan number and the borrower's name on each page, or else the asset manager would look at it and be like, nah, we're gonna, we're just gonna pass it. We're just sure. You're, we're gonna put you down at the bottom of the pile. Um, and then I did that for a few years. Then I worked for a property management company, actually uh, one of the largest in, actually the largest in Orange County. It was uh, the Irvine Company, who uh, at that time they owned an eighth of all the landmass in Orange County. Wow. Yeah, yeah. They're a huge company. Um, and it's funny, while I was working for them, the first building that they bought outside the state of California was uh was 70 i think it was 77 wacker here in chicago oh sure yeah 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 but uh worked for them for about a year and a half got homesick moved back to chicago uh i was working in uh i worked for cbre in the river North sure for, on the, uh, we on the commercial uh, side yep on the commercial yeah. side um and working mostly in the uh investment and uh retail leasing uh, division. And then uh, I was, I kind of got to a crossroads where I had to either decide if I wanted to stay in that or go back in residential. And residential, since I'd been in it for so long, that kind of always had my, you know, always had my heart and I knew I wanted to get back into it. Um, and lo and behold, I uh, decided to, uh, to reach out to, I actually reached out to somebody at another podcast, don't hate me for that. Uh, <laughs> thinking about Redfin, sure. And um, somebody from I, I actually tweeted to them, and somebody from Redfin's HR department saw my tweet and reached out to me, and um, I've been wow. with them ever since. Well, I think we've had we've had at least one or probably two other Redfin uh, people on the show over the years, but it's been a long time. And I know yeah. that Redfin has such a um, has such a generates such a strong response from other realtors. It's <laughs> a good way to put it. <laughs> well, well, I don't think it's necessarily a, a negative response. I just think it's a very people have an opinion about it. Um, mm. And I think that, um, you know, I've always think that it's a good idea to sort of understand, you know, who Redfin Redfin is as a company because, um, you know, to us, the way I see it, so I, I work at a real estate brokerage. Um, we have 700 brokers here. Um, I see, uh, I don't see any other firm as competition to our firm. Um, and I don't think that's because I'm magnanimous or I have this Zen-like approach. I just think there's enough business for everybody. Right. And I think that Redfin was really smart because when they started, see, I come from the tech world. I was an IT guy. I mean, that, that okay. I was marketing IT guy for years and years and years, not a real estate guy. So when I saw disruptors like Zillow, Redfin come in the market, I was like, that's brilliant because they're really lead companies. And then, you know, this is years and years ago when, when that's all they were. And now we see Zillow has started to, you know, take steps steps forward to not necessarily become a traditional brokerage, but, you know, they've expanded and now have realtors to help with certain things. Redfin right. did the same thing. Originally, they were just, you know, a t an IT firm who then figured out, oh my gosh, we have cornered like the SEO market and we are showing up at the top of searches and they're, you know, a really brilliant strategy. And then now they have, now they're a full service brokerage firm. And, and I think they serve a very specific, well, clearly they serve a very specific need, but I always think it's important for agents to really sort of demystify. So we have Zillow come on the show once a month, they demystify Zillow. Um, but I always like to hear, hear about brokers who work at Redfin because 
without exception, the brokers I know over the years who have either been on the show that work at Redfin or just people I know personally, they absolutely love it. And so I'm, I'm very curious to, to, to get your opinion on, on why you chose Redfin, you know, and, and how you think they fit into the overall brokerage business. Sure. And it's a, it's a lot to unpack there, but, uh, yeah. but I think, you know, I'm not like a, a Redfin, like apologist, um, I will say, you know, there's some things that we do as a company that I don't, you know, I don't really like, sure. uh, but I would say, and I, I don't necessarily agree with, but overall I would say, I mean, it's a great company to work for. Um, and I think you kind of, you kind of hit the nail on the head. I, I, when I talk to brokers, when I talk to brokers and they have like a negative opinion of, of, of Redfin, um, a few things. One, I mean, I, I'm sure everybody, especially now, right now with the, uh, the, the state of the world, everybody's heard the phrase um, confirmation bias. Sure. Well, I think a lot of what people, when people have a negative uh, experience with a Redfin agent, um, I think a lot of it is just really based on confirmation bias. So if you kind of go into the transaction and you hear, you know, certain things about Redfin agents and then something happens, you're like, Oh God, typical Redfin agent, you know, they're not, they're not answering my phone calls, my texts, they're, they're, they're lazy, whatever. Um, I've, I've heard it all at this point, but I, I feel like for me, I almost have like an outside perspective because I was away from residential. Sure back into it and it was pretty funny because I'll never forget I was at a uh I was at a, a G rate of Palooza uh which I, I don't know if you've ever gone to one of those so yeah so for everyone listening guaranteed rate is is a large lender uh, they're nationwide but they're headquartered in Chicago they're the biggest lender here in in the city so he says G rate we we all call it G rate but it's guaranteed right but yeah they have a giant party every year uh I've not been but I I uh, I've always been not able to go but yeah <laughs> That's fun. But I, I was at one my first year back in residential and uh, like I was kind of, I was almost um, like insulated to, to the stigma or to the, to the negative comments about Redfin. And it, it didn't take long to be back in the business. I was like, Oh, okay. I, I see there's, there's a, uh, we have kind of a negative reputation. And I was at a G rate of Palooza and uh, I was talking to this agent and I won't say what company I should work for. But we were talking and she goes, well, what company do you work for? I'm like, oh, I work for Redfin. And she said something and I said, well, we basically, you know, we do the same thing. She goes, no, yeah. we do not do the same thing. I said, oh. I said well, are, unless, you're, unless you're curing cancer on the side, we do basically right. the same thing. Like, unless yeah. you're, you know, like, I, I don't know what you're doing that I, you, you, you feel that. But I, I find that when I when I talk to agents about about Redfin, um, you know, I, it, it's it's really they it's really a, a confirmation bias that they that they have that they they heard certain things about us, and then if they have one misstep or one issue in a transaction, and it just confirms that. Um, you know, they, they tend to, to throw out the baby with the bathwater and think every Redfin agent's like that. That's well, it's, it's the same thing if an agent buys leads from, from Zillow or, and they get, you know, they, you know, you're only going to close probably 5% of your leads. If you're amazing, uh, at, at, you know, live transfer phone leads, um, 5%, 10% if you're a total superstar. So nine out of 10 times, it's not gonna, you're not gonna end a result with a transaction. And so right. I think, you know, anything like that, if it, when people purchase leads and, and they try it once and it doesn't work out for the first month, it's like, well, it's not supposed to really work out the first month. Um, right. and, and, and I, you know, it's funny. I, um, I don't, what I don't hear is from our listeners or from agents. I mean, we have, hundreds and hundreds of agents at our firm. I never hear anything negative about Redfin agents ever. I, I really don't. I, I mean, maybe it exists, but I don't hear that. Um, yeah. But I hear agents annoyed at like the Redfin pricing model. And sure. I always think, you know, 
um, I, you know, I, I don't really see that as any sort of issue for other realtors. I think it's a great service. It makes sense. The pricing makes sense. And they service a very specific type of, of buyer or seller. And I, I just think it's a brilliant strategy. And evidence, not just by my opinion, now you guys are like the second or third largest real estate company in Chicago. So it's clearly working, which I think yeah. is, is, is great. And I think well, there's also probably just some um, inherent, maybe a little bit of jealousy around. That too. <laughs> sure. And you know what, anytime it, it's just kind of like, um, you know, it's kind of like how people hate the Dallas Cowboys because they brought that on themselves by trying to brand themselves America's team. Sure. But we position ourselves in the market as a disruptor. And if you position yourself, you're going to get yeah. <laughs> inherent, inherent yeah. because of that. But the way I look at it and the way I look, yeah, I've always looked at this business is, and you hit the nail on the head earlier. It, it, some of those brokers just have like a scarcity mindset where they, yeah. there's only a finite amount of business. And if somebody's taking a certain amount, then that it leaves less for me. Whereas I look at it like there's, you're not getting a piece of the pie. You can grow the pie. You can grow the pie as big as you want. And much like there is a, a place in the market for Walmart or Target, there's still Nordstrom's. There's still other. So people can really, you know, consumers can pick what level of service that they want. Um, there's enough business for everybody. And I really do think it's kind of funny because I'll talk to an agent and they will, on one hand, talk about how bad Redfin agents are, but in the same breath, they'll say we're a disruptor and we're taking away business. And I'll say, well, if we're so bad, how are we taking away business from you? If we're that bad, then you, right. <laughs> right. you should be able to easily overcome any objection, you know, that if we're going into the same listing appointment, you should be able to overcome that if I'm that bad. But also, I just, no matter what company you work for, if it's Apple, yeah. It's Coldwell Banker, Redfit. I truly believe in this business, like anything else, you have got to invest in yourself. You've got mm -hmm. to educate yourself. You've got to stay on top of the market. You've got to know what's going on. And I think that's really what's going to, what's going to help you, you know, separate you from, from your competitors is, is how, how well you're educated, how well uh, you know the market, you know the neighborhoods. If you, if you know, uh, if you know all of that and you're investing in yourself and you are taking the time to learn, um, you make yourself uh, undisruptible. If that's even uh, you're right. You're right. Yeah. And you're right. And, and ultimately the, the proof is in the client choices, right? So if, if clients are choosing uh, one realtor over another or one company over another, it's because they see value in that product or service. And uh, Redfin is not a fly by night organization. You guys have been around a long time. And uh, I mean, for, you know, a tech company to, to now, which is a full service brokerage, um, you know, it's, it's been around a long time. It's a proven model that clearly works. And, mm -hmm. and I think you're right. I don't think it takes away just, just as any top producer doesn't take away from a lower producer, no matter what firm they're at, um, you know, you're attracting people who want to work with you and, and maybe you lose some deals uh, here and there as well, because uh, you know, your, your sphere of influence maybe goes with someone else instead of, instead of you, but that's, that's just normal. Um, I think, you know, at least here in the Chicagoland market, there's, you know, it's almost an infinite amount of business really. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I guess maybe that argument could be, would be stronger in a, in a more rural environment where there's a lot less activity and right. there's only a certain amount of transactions that people are sort of divvying up. But in, in bigger markets, it's just, there's room for everyone. I mean, I'm at a firm that pays almost 100% in, uh, in their commissions back to realtors. There's a lot of realtors that, that think that's, um, have, that has a lot of negative feelings about that. Um, and, but yet we don't really take away from any of the other traditional firms and Redfin doesn't, I don't think either. Um, I think yeah. you guys are, are great. I, I love technology because it really gets everyone to up their game. And yeah. some of the old traditional models are going to, you know, possibly suffer in the future if they don't adapt. And so oh. I love the disruptors because they come in and they say, all right, time to up everyone's game. And, uh, and it works. Um, and, but and not, not to, not to interrupt you, but sure. to, to, to that point, so, you know, I, I got in the business 17 years ago, which is insane to think about, but 
you know, by and large, the brokerage model hasn't really changed much. Yeah. And in my opinion, it needed to be disrupted because, you know, it, it, and I'll touch back on this too, but you really, you get these companies that, I mean, we have a low, let's face it, we have a low barrier of entry to our industry. Sure. Or get your license, you hang it. You can literally, uh, for under $1,000, you can essentially start a, a company. There's a, a company with limitless income potential, which what other industry can you find that in? Right. But because of that, uh, you also, you get a, you get a wide variety of people. You get uh, sure. you know, people who may not be honest or, or what have you, but um, really the, the traditional brokerage model kind of works like this. You know, you get your license, you go hang, you know, you hang it with a, with a company who, who will hire literally anybody. Sure. Um, and they don't train you and they don't provide you really any kind of support of any kind, yet they still take 50 or 70% of everything you bring in. And it's literally, here's a phone or not, sometimes not even that. It's like, here's a desk, you know, start, start bringing in money. Um, and really that's a, that's a bad, that's a poor business model. I mean, I think you, when you look at the different companies out there right now, Keller Williams uh, at Properties, uh, D. April. I'm a huge fan of Ryan D. April's, uh, yeah. you know, his interviews and his. Oh, good. They're very, they're very coaching focused, which is what you. Yeah. I mean, it's it's really it, it's a it's a when you think about it, fundamentally, the brokerage model as it sits today is really a, a kind of a bad business model, especially because because the internet and information is so pervasive and is everywhere, a lot of times you will talk to a home buyer or a home seller. They'll know more than most of the realtors. They really will. For sure. All they do is they sit and they look at, you know, Redfin Zillow and they study the market. Well, that, that's got to change and it's got to change to, to, to benefit consumers. And, and really, I hope I'm not going on too long of a tangent here, but really, when you think about it, the role of the real estate agent has really changed dramatically uh, in, in, in the 20 years that I've been in the business. And in fact, when I was, when I was debating on staying in commercial or going back in residential, it's pretty funny because uh, hindsight is of course 2020, but I was really reluctant to go back into residential because I saw how pervasive technology was becoming. And I thought, why would people even need a real estate agent in a few years when, you know, there's so much technology, there's so many things that, you know, could disrupt that industry to get rid of the agent altogether. Sure. It would make more sense just to stay in commercial. However, the longer I'm in residential real estate, the more I realize our job security is, is not threatened because, first of all, because there's so much information, you get a, I find that consumers get analysis by paralysis. There's so much out there that you really need somebody who can interpret that and distill that down for them and say, here's what's really going on. Um, but also, People, I, I, you could have the most either type A, well put together client who on the surface seems like they have it all together. When it comes to their selling or buying a home, they are emotional, nervous wrecks and they need somebody there to hold their hand. They need somebody there to walk them through the process. So I think when this, in this business, when it, when they, when I first got in it, you really needed more IQ. I feel like now you need more EQ, more yeah. personal intelligence. You need- Yeah, the disruptors have really taken the um, the objective uh, parts of it and, and the empirical parts of it, the parts that used to be behind lock and key, access mm -hmm. to information data, and have you know opened that door. And, and agents probably initially are very threatened by that. Now I think they're starting to realize Oh, well, that frees up their time to focus on that emotional side of it, which is ultimately what really drives the bus anyway. The information's Absolutely. always been there, but the emotional guidance, um, when Ryan and I were talking just before we started, I'm buying a property 
and I haven't done it in some time. And I'm like completely overwhelmed by the whole thing. And uh, even though I'm in this industry and I shouldn't be, uh, even I am overwhelmed by it. And so um, thankfully my boss is helping me with a lot of it because I, I need somebody to like, what they say, like um, a doctor who, who uh, treat or a lawyer who represents themselves as a fool for a client. Yeah. Now he's, you know, I, I'm just like, please help me with this because I just get too emotional about it. I everything. mean, I, I just yesterday I saw a, um, I saw an article on uh, ABC seven uh, on their website that said Chicago, just the headline, Chicago real estate market is, is, is hot or something along those lines. Mm -hmm. and I emailed it to some of my fellow listing agents and I, I put the subject in the, uh, in the email fake news. And I said, <laughs> Just waiting for one of my clients to, to, you know, that's wondering why their home isn't selling and they see this. Yeah. When you drill down to it, I looked at the, the agent that he quoted and nothing against the agent at all because it's yeah. not him, but where he's selling and, and really, if you read what he said, he was really talking mostly about the suburbs and, and certain parts of the, of the city, like Bronzeville. Bronzeville is still a very hot market, but by and large, I mean, the city market's pretty, you know, we're in the fall doldrums right now. Sure. Um, but yeah, it, it's just, it's having that, that market knowledge and that expertise to say, you know, okay, that, that article is, you know, if you drill down to it, here's why it's incorrect. Here's right. really, here's, here's what's really going on in the market. And that's right. where, you know, that's when your clients rely on your expertise. Yeah. And I'd love to get your thoughts on where you think everything's headed. So, you know, we have, we're closing up 2020 here the next few months, um, 2021's just around the corner. Um, not that anyone's got a, a crystal ball that's a hundred percent accurate. Um, none of us are like the Oracle at Delphi, but, but if you had to make any sort of guesses about where we're headed, um, what, what do you, what do you think's around the corner? You know, I, I personally, I, I want to be, this could probably, this recording could probably age horribly, but I'm going to, I'm going to say it anyway. Everyone I've, every time I've ever talked, it's aged horribly on my end. So I say stupid, I say things that are, that I found out later were inaccurate or untrue or didn't come to fruition. So don't even worry. Uh, it happens to me all the time. It's funny because back in, uh, back in February, I'll never forget. I mean, I had probably two weeks straight where almost every single day I had a client calling me, hey, what's going on with this COVID? Do you think it's going to do it for our market? And I remember saying, nah, it's like the flu. We'll be fine. Because <laughs> at that time, I mean- well, we all thought that. We yeah, we all that. thought that. And the spring market was so hot. Like this was one of the hottest spring markets I'd seen since like 2017. I was like, I I'll never forget talking with uh, my uh, one of my managers, Stephanie Brimo, and I was saying, I, I need more inventory. I'm like, everything I'm putting on the market is selling either first weekend or first two weeks. Um, you know, I need more inventory and, you know, I sure enough, I, I got it. Um, and then, you know, the market, the market started to, you know, once shelter in place took effect. Sure. But I personally, I'm going to be cautiously optimistic. I feel like despite who wins the election, uh, our country is so, divided that I think uh, half of the uh, people, half of the population is going to be happy with who yeah. wins, the other half is not. But I feel like, you know, there's enough people, there's 7 billion people on this planet, someone's got to come up with a vaccine soon. Um, I feel that, you know, if, big if, if there's a vaccine, uh, and depending on who gets elected, I feel like the spring market, I think the first quarter and I think spring market is going to be hot. I think we'll, we'll still see, uh, we'll see some renewed optimism and a lot of demand. Um, and I think, um, you know, I think it's probably, especially in the city, it's probably going to uh, continue to, to favor buyers as it is right now. Um, and I think that, um, you know, people, people have uh, what I lovingly refer to as goldfish memory, which is not very long. And, you know, I feel like uh, people will still continue to, uh, to buy and sell in the city. I just think what they buy and sell might change. Uh, every, almost uh, every single family home listing I've had in the city this year uh, that was 
priced, I would say under 800,000 has sold, uh, you know, first weekend with multiple offers. Uh, I think the suburbs uh, are going to continue to be red hot. Um, I, I put uh, a family member's home on the market out in Mount Prospect last week at, on Tuesday. By Friday, we had, uh, we had 20 offers. That's incredible. It's insane. Um, and I was, and it's funny because I was telling them, I was like, well, the city market's really slow right now. Um, I said, you know, I know the suburbs are hot. I, and I looked at the market stats. I was like, it's, it's a hot market where you're at. I think we're going to get a lot of activity on your home. I didn't think it was going to be 20, 20 offers. So yeah, that's, I mean, interest rates aren't going anywhere anytime soon. I think the big question marks like everybody has is, you know, uh, you know, what's going to happen with, uh, you know, uh, employment and, and, and uh, you know, a vaccine and, and opening back up completely. But I think if we get the, I, I feel like when this first happened, everybody was so taken aback by it and just kind of adjusting to this new normal. But you saw after about, uh, after about three weeks of shelter in place, People were out looking again, and uh, you know, April was actually. I think April. I'd have to look back. April was, I think, still my best month of the year. I put, uh, I wow. and put nine under contract. So, um, but I think, uh, I think if if we see a vaccine, we have some renewed sense of optimism. I think we're going to see a strong spring market. Yeah, that's interesting. And then do you feel that the agent's role has shifted since COVID? Um, or is it, uh, you talked about, you know, being the guide through the emotional side of, of a transaction, which of course will, will likely not change because um, AI, maybe AI one day can figure out how to do that. As of right now, uh, realtors are still the best uh, way to guide someone through. Um, the ups and downs of a transaction. Um, do you feel, do you see any part of the realtor's role sh shifting at all? You know, I, th I think, um, you know, just being able to, um, you know, I think being able to leverage the, the technology, technology that's available, like, uh, you know, virtual tours, um, that sort of thing. But I think, um, I think we're, we're probably going to, um, I think I, I really think that our role might actually increase in terms of um, just emotional support and yeah. uh, and just being able to to guide people through it. Um, I I know for me uh, because I I would say probably about ninety eight or ninety nine percent of my business is working with sellers. Uh, so whenever I am working with a buyer, I'm always looking at the resale, like what's the potential resale. I never, I never ever tell people, well, I think this is going to appreciate X. I never say that. But sure. What I do tell them is because I see it so often, I say, these are things to look for when you do go to, to resell. Um, like things like, you know, not having dual vanity in the master bedroom ensuite and, and that sort of thing. But I, I do think that um, it's almost like uh, you, you have to be a little bit of a, of a uh, of a psychic and tell them hey when it uh, when you do go to sell you need to probably keep these things in mind people are going to want to have a home office people are now probably going to have to have uh an in-home um you know in-home classroom for their kids yeah uh, you know, it, it's it's keeping those things in mind but also i feel like and this this really hasn't changed too much but i think it might again it might increase it's just being able to advise them on on certain things to, uh, you know, to upgrade their homes, like, you know, putting in a, a you know, a nice air felt, like a more expensive air filter or air filtration system or um, any kind of uh, like antibacterial or, you know, yeah, any, makes sense. anything like that. So I think that's really, uh, really it. Cause I, I, you know, I haven't personally seen my role change drastically in, in terms of, uh, you know, how I go about my day to day with my clients, but I think just on what I'm advising them on and just being a lot more of emotional, <laughs> a lot more emotional support sure. uh, before, I think that's, uh, that's really what I'm seeing changing the most right now. I was, um, I, the, I was meeting for the condo that I'm, 
uh, purchasing the meeting with the designer. I was telling Ryan about this uh, offline, but it really, this particular part of it kind of speaks to what you just mentioned. And I was feeling a tremendous amount of pressure as the buyer. Forget that I'm an agent because I don't, I don't practice real estate myself. So I'm not really an agent, even though I technically have the license. But um, so I'm, I'm just a, a, a moron buyer who doesn't really know what he's doing. And, and so I'm going through and I'm just feeling so much pressure because I'm not going to live in this condo forever. I mean, I, you know, we're not moving in even until probably January, but I'm not going to be there the rest of my life. So I have this tremendous, felt this tremendous pressure in perch, you know, figuring out what, um, you know, what finishes I wanted, uh, what colors for everything, uh, what the cabinet should look like, you know, there's a lot of different options. And I thought, well, I have to always think about resale. And I, I wanted to pick everything that I thought with my, you know, crystal ball would be still attractive five years from now, 10 years from now, whenever we, right. we end up moving from there. And think, and I just, it was just so much pressure. And finally, my girlfriend, who is now a realtor, she wasn't at the time, but, but what is now, and, and also the designer just said, don't worry, everything ages terribly. <laughs> she said, everything is going to look bad in 10 years. It, they're going, right. and people are going to walk through and go, what were they thinking? How did, why would they have chosen that? And we went with like super neutral, simple, basic things. She, and I thought that was the safe thing, safe thing. She was in 10 years, people are going to be like, that was dumb. Why didn't right. anybody do it? And I, and it, and I have to be honest, like that really helped me as a buyer uh, go, okay, I don't have to worry that much. It's all going to be look at as goofy in 10 years, which is a little depressing, but also makes sense because, yeah. you know, we were looking at condos that were built, you know, 15 years ago, which is, I, I had a condo uh, 15 years ago as well. And, and the choices I made back then, I think are still reasonable today, but they were really cool back then. And now they're <laughs> kind of, uh, and we looked at a lot of places who were built, you know, 15 years ago and the, it just doesn't age well. And so the, the good news is nothing ages well. The, it's also the bad news, but it yeah. takes, takes some of the pressure off to, uh, for, it's at least for me. And I felt better about it. Um, I, I mean, maybe I just feel more defeated, but, but yeah. the reality of it is, is I was like, okay, I needed somebody to tell me that. And, and I suspect, um, uh, buyers, you know, who are working with agents, I'm representing myself, of course. So, um, so I didn't have the luxury of somebody guiding me through that, but, uh, well, to Ryan's point, these are the kind of things that agents can provide a tremendous amount of value. I cannot tell you how stressed I was about it, really it trying is. to make the right decision. And turns out there is no right decision really. So no, and I was like, okay, I, now I feel better. I tell, I tell, um, I, I have a couple of, uh, of like new newbie agents that, uh, they don't work for Redfin, but, um, they, they reach out to me for, for help. And, you know, if they have questions on something and believe it or not, I used to play, uh, offensive line, uh, for football when I was, oh, wow. well, I wasn't very good. Um, it turns out if you're short, fat and slow, you're good <laughs> at sports. Um, but <laughs> I played offensive line and our offensive line coach used to say, used to say this, when you're blocking, don't, don't try to push people where you want them to go. You push them where they're already going and you just yeah. moving them. So I find yeah. a lot of times with clients, you're really, yeah, you, you are advising them if they're, if they're trying to make a decision and it's, it's something that could harm them or, or sure. really be bad down the road. But a lot of times what people are looking for is just for, uh, for a confirmation. confirmation that they're not, yeah, that they're right. making the right decision. Yeah. Right, right, right. It's, uh, it's, it's interesting, but, uh, but also to, to touch on that again, I sound like an old man, but when I first got in the business, I feel like interior design trends used to last like 10 years now with Instagram, yeah. TV, everything, you know, now I feel like trends last three to five years. So try yeah. to like chase the trends or, or plan that far ahead. You, you, your, 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 your broker instructed you in the right way, you know, do something neutral, do what you like. And right. put that uh, when, when you cross that bridge later down the road. So curious if you had, you know, you've been in the, the business and, and in and around the business uh, for 17 years now, um, any advice for our listeners who are, you know, and you've given a lot of advice already, but maybe for people who aren't as busy, um, you know, who are, even though there is a lot of activity going on, um, but you may not be seeing a lot of it yourself personally, um, for our, those people, you know, what would you suggest or what would you recommend for them to, uh, you know, really set themselves up for success, you know, in the next few months? 
Uh, really, I think, again, uh, I, I, I don't think uh, educating yourself, uh, you know, could be, you know, you, you, I can't state that enough. Just knowing what's going on in the market, uh, investing in yourself, uh, reading books, listening to podcasts such as this, learning everything that you can about real estate. But when it comes to the actual like uh, acquiring of clients, you would be surprised at you know how many people that might be in your sphere don't actually know that you sell real estate. So just yes. just reaching out to people and being consistent, I think that's what really makes this business so hard. Is you 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 have to work consistently and and you have to work. Uh, diligently for a long time and you don't see any results and it's yeah. frustrating. And that's what kind of separate, that, that's why I, I don't know what the statistic is, but the average real estate agent, I think only stays in the business like two years or maybe yeah. less. Um, but I think letting your sphere know, cause you would be surprised at how many people in your sphere, especially depending on what age you are, if you're just out of college, you know, you'd be surprised at how many people, um, you know, might be looking to buy or sell a home, but also, um, you know, it, you might have that, uh, you might have that feeling like, uh, you know, you don't have any experience. So how are you going to get a listing or how you can get a buyer? You can always partner with an agent who's been doing it longer um, and, and they can help you out. You just don't be afraid to reach out to people. But uh, the other thing that I, I actually like doing is, uh, is for sale by owners. Uh, because sure. People, these are people that all are already have their hand raised and say that they want to sell. And, and the problem is they don't, they think they know the market. They probably don't. They probably don't know the little things that they should be doing to sell their home. Just knock on the door. And if anything, just offer value to them and say, Hey, here's what's going on in the market. Don't, don't go in it with like, maybe even with the feeling of, uh, of getting their listing, but at least offering some sort of help. And you never know, it might, it might turn into, uh, it might turn into something, but I feel like uh, as long as you're delivering some, some value or some knowledge, and even if you, let's just say that you, you've been in the business only for a few months, um, chances are you, you've probably know more than the average person. If you've been spending time to invest in yourself and listen and educate yourself, um, but just being able to, to help people out and, and deliver value and, and reach out to, you know, your sphere, your friends, your family. Um, and, and that's it. It's kind of, it's, it's a little bit more difficult to do now that with, uh, you know, with uh, everything being so uh, weird and everybody sure. has face masks. But I, I used to, uh, when I first got in the business, I would just go and work at a Starbucks with a laptop and I had a sticker on there. Uh, my stepmom's company's name was Winning Properties, but we had a, I had a Winning Properties sticker on my laptop and, and just a little label that said, if you have real estate questions, ask me um, on the back of the laptop. And I would get people that would come up to me and start asking me things and start asking me questions. And uh, even now, um, uh, last summer, uh, Joel knows I always... I used to always work from the uh, the Starbucks by that's uh, attached to the Cubs uh, corporate office. Sure, I have a, a Redfin sticker on there, and I'd have people come up to me and ask me questions all the time there. And um, but even just um, you know just offering some sort of a you know some value to people, letting them know what's going on in the market. Um, but really, I feel like if you have no if you have no uh, clients of your own at, at this time reaching out to your sphere, doing open houses for people, uh, for other brokers in your office, just really doing anything, doing some sort of activity just to, to get your, your name out there and get yourself out there is going to be beneficial. And also you said this very quickly, but I just want to you know reiterate this point about calling for sale by owners or expired mm -hmm. listings, which um, for our listeners, you can purchase these leads. There are many, many uh, tech companies that will uh, provide this data to you for a very reasonable price. These are not expensive um, marketing decisions and they'll send you, you know, a daily list of all the expireds or the FISBOs in your area. And I would be very curious. I don't know if there's any statistics that are, are, repu are reliable, but I'm curious on how many for sale by owners end up listing with a realtor. Um, yeah. I would be very curious because the, the challenge of course is that you know, most homeowners want to overvalue uh, the, I, I, I am guilty of it as well. When I, when I sold a condo five or six years ago, I, 
I absolutely overpriced it. And I knew that I was overpricing it and I couldn't stop myself <laughs> because, uh, <laughs> because I, I, you know, I wasn't, um, I shouldn't, I should have, I should have gotten some more opinions. And as soon as I lowered the price, it, it sold. Um, but the point is, is that, you know, this is a natural inclination of anyone, anyone who is selling a home. And so if somebody thinks they're doing it themselves, they're, 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 yes, you might call them on a cold call or you might go and knock on the door and they might say, I don't want to work with a realtor. That's why I'm doing this myself. I totally understand Mr. or Mrs. Seller. And, and then, but you could say, but I, I did have an idea for you, or I did, I was thinking about you and I, I wanted to give this to you um, oh. instead of just, well, list with me. Cause they're going to likely say, I don't want to list with you. I'm doing it myself, but providing yeah. value as Ryan said is, is really the key. And I, a lot of them end up listing with a realtor. So. Yeah. I, I don't know what the stat is either because I don't know if there's a way to really quantify yeah. it. I can say this again, uh, you know, not to sound like uh, uh, Adam Sandler and Waterboy, but my stepmom, uh, you saw tell me, uh, you know, when I first got in the business, you know, FISBOs are the easiest, you know, client to get in a sense because they already have their hand raised. They're already telling people they want to sell. And I used to do stupid things like, I think it was, I learned it from uh, the Tom Hopkins uh, tapes. That sure. How old these things were uh, it was actually on tape, but I would make flyers for the seller for their home and drop them off. Like they'd be color printed um, and, you know, they look great. And I would just drop them off and say, Hey, you know, obviously you're trying to sell. I don't know if you have any flyers or marketing material, but here's something I came up with. And um, you know, I, I, I think I actually got a few uh, FISBOs early on uh, in my, in my day, in my, early on in my career, just doing that, um, uh, just creating little things like that. And you can even without, um, you know, without having to go in the home, uh, if they are on a website or anything like that, you can create, you know, you can create flyers, you can create all kinds of marketing materials for them. And, you know, you never know, it could, it could turn into something. So. In the last few minutes that we have, I would really love to chat, and this could be a much longer conversation, so I'll ask just for, for a shortened uh, conversation around it, and I apologize for, for running low on time, but would love to hear about mindset, because I just think ultimately that is what really gets you through the day. It was, it's what gets you started uh, and ends the day, and, and being really, really careful and guarded almost about um, what's going in, uh, what what you're ruminating on, um, and how to set yourself up just for the highest level of energy and success. Because it is, we, we all know, everyone listening or watching knows this is a difficult business. It's not impossible, but it is not easy. And um, it's it's actually quite challenging, but it's ultra, ultra rewarding too. Um, but I'm curious if you have any thoughts about um, mindset and just sort of what you do to stay motivated and, and stay positive and productive. Sure. And I, again, I could probably go on all day about this, but anybody, <laughs> I, I think it really, it all, you know, the, your next day starts the night before, you know, figuring out what you're going to, you know, do the next day and, and, and putting out a task list. Uh, anybody who follows me on, uh, on social media knows that I get up really early. I'm usually up about quarter to five. And I, first thing I do is I go for a walk. Uh, I walk to the lake. I always like to see the sun coming up. I, I, jokingly say uh, I made a bet with the sun that every single day I was going to be waking up before the sun. <laughs> so, but uh, actually I should say the first thing I do every morning and I posted it, I posted at the end of the year. Um, very first thing I do when I get out of bed is I write out my goals uh, three times. I, there's nothing magical about that. It's just uh, it's just, I like to, but there, there is in a way something slightly magical about it because for some reason it actually works in a weird yeah. way. Something happens, especially if you're able to put pen to paper, I don't know mm -hmm. why that, that matters. And, and if you do it digitally, that's fine. Yeah. Um, but there is something about writing out your goals that does something and it's almost an invisible, unmeasurable thing. Um, but there's something that does actually get activated by doing that. Yeah. And I, I think to your point, there is something about actually writing it. And I forget what the term is. Uh, somebody said that writing by hand is, I want to say, I want to say it's autonomic. I, I don't, that's probably not even a word, but they said basically like 
when you have to write something versus typing it, it forces your brain to think more. Yeah. Um, think more about it and focus more on it. So I write out my goals three times a day. I go for a walk. Uh, I go to the lake. I watch the sun come up. Uh, I'm a huge, uh, huge fan of audiobooks and obviously podcasts. But um, I, I really, I listen to a lot of music, but I mostly, I, I try to uh, listen to as many audiobooks as I can. Um, and what I'll do is I'll, I'll pick a book uh, for a month and listen to that book as many times through for a month straight. Um, and, uh, just really kind of saturate my mind with it. But, um, a really good one that I highly recommend, uh, which was perfect timing was when the, uh, when the, uh, the last dance documentary came out, there's a book called, uh, relentless by Tim Grover, which is, Tim Grover is Michael Jordan and LeBron and Kobe Bryant's trainer. And I was already listening. I had already listened to that book about seven times already before the documentary came out. It was just interesting to me to see what he was talking about in that book be played out in like come to fruition on that documentary. It was very interesting to me, but uh, this sounds really lame and cheesy, but it's how I, how I approach things. Um, you know, I, I've long given up my dreams of becoming an athlete, uh, unless, uh, you know, the bears need a, a 39 year old, uh, back who can't throw, which we already have. <laughs> um, but I treat, I treat my life and I treat my business kind of like an athlete. And if you, if you train like an athlete, um, you're constantly, uh, you know, like Kobe, Jordan, uh, LeBron, they were constantly studying game film. Well, that's looking at market stats. That's yep. looking at the market, seeing what's going on. That's like my study in game film, um, listening to books on, on negotiating or any, anything I can do to get that competitive edge uh, is, is the way I look at it. And it kind of, it kind of reinvigorates my excitement about the, about the business, especially this time of the year. Um, I've uh, it's not a brag. It's just kind of how I approach things. I don't take any days off from January to August. Well, this year I haven't taken any days off from January till today. I, I, I don't take any days off. Um, I probably need to. Um, my last day where I did not have to look at my phone and have it near me was Christmas. Um, but it, it really, uh, it really does help kind of reinvigorate you and helps keep you focused. If you, if you approach it in that way that, Hey, much like, um, I, I often compare the, the Chicago real estate season to a baseball season because it's long. Yeah. Um, it's, you know, nine to 10 months until we get into the fall and winter. Um, and how else are you going to, to stay focused and stay excited about it? You've got to find out those little things that keep you engaged, um, that keep you checked in. Um, and, and I think that's really important is just, uh, you know, feeding your mind with, uh, with, you know, positive, positive information. Uh, I, I work out, I go to the gym every single day. And while I'm at the gym, I'm listening to audiobooks. I'm listening yeah. to podcasts. I, I very rarely, if ever, listen to music while I'm working out. And I just think, you know, it, it's, you know, the whole adage, uh, the old adage, garbage in, garbage out. If you're constantly feeding your mind with, with good information, with positivity, you're going to, you know, you're, you're gonna, it's just gonna, you're kind of gonna just emote it and it's gonna come out in your life. Uh, it's really how I, how I look at it. Yeah. I think that was really perfectly said. Um, and a great place to wrap up, um, for our, Brian, before we do, I want to, um, make sure that, that all of our listeners know, because not everyone who listens or watches this, this show is an agent. Some are buyers, sellers, renters, investors, uh, who are looking for top agents. We, we hear this every, uh, which was completely unexpected for me when I started the show, I never thought, non eight, uh, real estate agents would, would be interested in the show. And then I realized, oh, they're listening because they want to work with top agents because we're a show of uh, interviewing top agents. So it actually does sometimes generate business for agents, which is not the reason why Ryan's here on the show. But I do, um, but I do want to make sure that anyone who's listening who wants to work with Ryan here in the Chicagoland area knows how to get in touch. Um, Ryan, what's the best way somebody who was looking to work with you, a top 1% producer here in the area, um, how should they reach out to you? First of all, I didn't even know I was a top one person. <laughs> you are. <laughs> no, I, I had no idea. 
Um, probably uh, my cell phone. Uh, should I just give my number? Sure. Uh, it's uh, 708-668-6613. Um, also follow me on Instagram. I'm RPM Chicago and, uh, not like the restaurants, or I should say I'm not the restaurant, but it is like the restaurant. And uh, <laughs> funny enough, uh, Bill Rancic actually grew up not too far from where I grew up, just, you know, less than a half a mile away. We both went to the same, uh, high school. Oh, that's uh, funny. Of course, he's one of the owners of uh, RPM. Yeah, of RPM. Yeah. It's pretty um, funny. <laughs> well, Ryan, thank you so much for being on the show. Really appreciate it. Appreciate all the kind words you said about uh, about our show, but also all the information you provided. Um, it, it was really, really valuable, and I appreciate. Uh, and on behalf of the listeners, we, we want to thank you for for your time. You know, And I know how busy you are because you don't take days off. <laughs> and uh, and so I, I appreciate uh, you taking a little a little bit of time to do this uh, to help um, to give back to, to the community and, and the real estate industry at large. Um, so thank you. And on behalf of Ryan and myself, to everyone who is listening or watching, we also say thank you um, for continuing to support our show. We ask you just to do two quick things before you go, or or maybe the next as soon as you turn this off, you can do it. Um, but number one is tell a friend. Think of another agent that could benefit from having heard this interview with Ryan, and send them a link. Or maybe it's a buyer or seller in the Chicagoland area that's looking for a top producer, right? Send it to send it to them. Um, but tell a friend. And then the second thing is to follow us on Facebook. Please follow, find us at facebook.com forward slash keeping it real pod. Um, this is where we post all of our episodes. We, every single day we find an articles written uh, by someone online de designed to help agents grow their business. We post that there. We don't post anything else, only good information to help you grow. So um, anyway, please find us again on Facebook. Ryan, thank you so much. It was a real pleasure. I'm excited Likewise. to continue to watch your, your growth in, in this market. <laughs> in this area and uh and thanks again yeah likewise thank you and again like yeah if there's a new agent listening to this i mean this podcast is uh i'm not just saying it because i'm on it but it's a invaluable resource and i wish i wish i would have had something like this rather than a uh than a uh, a stepmom beating me into <laughs> <laughs> well, it cleared the stepmom beating you, beating you up clearly worked. So, uh, yeah, it so, did, it did, it did. So I'm, we, uh, we honor really her weird. as well. We, we honor your stepmom because she, she got, she helped you. And, and I like the fact that she didn't uh, coddle you and there wasn't really any nepotism. No. She's like, you're doing it all yourself. No. I love that. No, she definitely did not do that. <laughs> well, on, on behalf of, uh, of, of Ryan and myself, again, thank you to everyone watching and listening. And uh, well, a little shout out to Ryan's mo uh, stepmom as well uh, for helping uh, get, get him on the right path uh, in real estate. So Ryan, thanks again. It was a real pleasure. Likewise, DJ. Thank you. <laughs>